It might not surprise you to hear that I kind of like Christmas. I like the Christmas music. You know, I, I like walking through the grocery store, the, the department store, you know, even like from time to time after waiting in the lineups outside, you know, Costco or whatever, and hearing Christmas carols and, and actually Christmas hymns being played on the loudspeakers and people singing along, right? I, I mean, it's, it's the, the only time of year when you actually hear Jesus being sung about in the public square. You, now, and often by people who, who couldn't tell you very much about him, really, other than what they, they hear in Christmas carols or Christmas hymns. And I, and I love the lights, right? So I don't know how many of you, but we've, as a family, we've driven through um, zoos uh, to, to see Glow. It's, it's beautiful. If you haven't done it, I, I, they're not paying me to tell you this, but if you haven't done it, take a drive, like spend the money and drive through. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. Dufferin Islands, it's stunning again this year. Um, down along the falls, I, I mean, I, I love it. I, every year we do it, even though most of the light display is, is the same every year. It, it, we do it and... and and we've got some stunning pictures of Logan this year, because now he's four, right? And so he's like standing there just awestruck by some of the... So, it, so I really like it. But what you might be a little shocked at is, I don't love it. I don't love it. Because, you know, because Christmas... Here's what happens at Christmas. We get, we get all of the... The, the, the arguments and the debates that happen, right? I want, so, so my, my Facebook feed is already full of, I want to put Christ back in Christmas, right? I want to say Merry Christmas. I don't want to say Happy Holidays. Who said I, who, who started writing Merry Xmas? Why did they take Christ out of Christmas? Like, and then you get, and then then you get the other side of it. You get my call, like some of my colleagues who, you know, they start talking about, well, why do we celebrate on December twenty fifth? Don't, don't people realize that that's a pagan thing? We started doing that because it was right around the winter solstice, and and we started celebrating Jesus's birthday because of, we wanted light in the midst of the darkness and. And, uh, and like, what, is, what does it mean when the, we talk about the mother of God and, uh, and, and homo oisius and, and all of these Latin terms start coming out? And, and, and then you, so, my, and my mind starts to explode. And then this, this slide appears on my, on my, my Facebook uh, feed with, with these words, right? I don't, so if you can't read it, I'm going to read it for you. It says, and Jesus said to the theologians, who do you say that I am? And they replied, you are the eschatological manifestation of the ground of our being, the kerygma of which we find the ultimate meaning in our interpersonal relationships. And Jesus said, what? Right? Because that's what happens. We, we get, like, like, we start to... Christmas brings about all of this stuff. So Christmas, like it, it just, it, it starts to bug me. But what I do love, I love Advent. Because Advent, Advent is the place where, where it just becomes real. And today, the readings we have today really make it real. The readings that we have today, so, so the, the reading from Isaiah, I'm going to come back to the Magnificat and Mary's declaration in a minute, but the reading that we have from Isaiah, I don't know if you, if you hear it, but the reading from Isaiah is actually the same reading, or, or, or Jesus uses that reading, 
when he first comes out of the desert. So when Jesus comes out of the desert after the temptation, so, so the, the story goes, Jesus, at, at, at about the age of 30, Jesus realizes his call. He realizes who he is and, and what, he's, what he's supposed to be about. So he comes from, from his, his life with his, with his mom and his, and his dad in, in wherever it is that they're living. And, and again, that's the questions of theologians, right? But where, wherever he is, he comes out of there, he goes to see John the Baptist, he gets baptized, and the Gospels say, from baptism, he goes into the desert, and he, and he goes through the, de- the, the 40 days of temptation. He comes out of the desert, and he goes to the synagogue. Now, this is Luke's Gospel. He goes to the synagogue, he goes into the synagogue, unrolls the, the scroll. So it says that he is given the scroll, he unrolls the scroll to the place where the prophet says, and the, where he unrolls the scroll is to the passage that Reverend Cheryl shared with us today. Where the prophet Isaiah describes, describes a, a part of who the Messiah is going to be. And uh, Cheryl, do you have the do you have the reading in front of you? And so I'm just going to read the first part. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, etc., etc. And then Jesus, in the synagogue, when when he's reading this, he says, you know, I've come to... Um, to heal the sick, to give sight to the blind, to feed the hungry, to proclaim the year of God's favor. Okay, so now we fast forward just a little bit, because then later on in the story, John the Baptist gets arrested, remember, by by Herod, because he's, he's preaching against Herod marrying his brother's wife, and, and John gets concerned. He's worried because he's in prison, and he's worried that, he's, that Jesus, he, he, he starts to doubt. And so he sends some of his disciples, his students, to, say to, Je- to ask Jesus, to say, you know, are you the one, or am I in prison for nothing? Like, have I, have I put my life on the line here for, for, for nothing? And Jesus says, go back and tell John that this is what you see. The blind are given sight. The lame are made to walk. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus goes back to this reading and says, tell John that this is what's happening. Because John will know that that is the sign that that makes that that is that 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 is proof that Jesus is the Messiah. So I've had a couple of profs over the last uh, six seven months because we're do- as you know Reverend Cheryl and I are both doing our our doctorates and and I've had two profs at least two, maybe even three, who have said, when you're writing your doctoral dissertation, it is not a mystery novel, right? So when you're writing your doctoral dissertation, what, what, at the, at the end, it shouldn't be a surprise. You should, in the introduction, tell people what you're going to do and what you're going to say And in the conclusion, 
they should be able to go back to the introduction and see that that's exactly what you did, right? In a mystery novel, you have the murder, and then you have 400 pages of, did he do it? Did she do it? Did they do it? What? Oh, it was him. I should have known it all along, right? Here in the gospel, at the very beginning, Jesus tells us exactly what's going to happen. Exactly what's going to happen. The blind are going to see. The lame are going to walk. The good news is going to be proclaimed to the poor. That this is the year, this is the time of God's favor. And at the end of the gospel, that's exactly what happens. And that's what Advent's about. Mary, in the, Magnificent, in the Magnificat, tells us, here is the, I am, she, I'm pregnant. I don't know how it happened. Well, I do know how it happened. But I'm pregnant. And my son, here, here's who my son is. My son is going to literally, literally turn things upside down. So, the, the hungry will be fed and the rich will be sent away hungry. Those who have will be disappointed because those who have not will be satisfied. Those who think they can see now will actually be blinded to what is right in front of them. And those who think they are blind right now will actually see the truth when it is revealed. That's glory. That is, uh, when I, if you want to think about good news, that, how much better can, can the news get? And all you need to do, all you need to do is believe. All we are asked to do is believe. Um, because when, when we believe, we realize that as wealthy as we might appear, we're all poor. That the promise of the gospel, the promise of the gospel is for all of us. That, that, that as much as we think we know, we don't know. All of those theologians who want to answer those questions with, you know, in the end, they don't know. And if they can admit that they don't know, then, then they can accept the gift that is offered in these words. Then they, they can accept the gift that is offered in this life. We are given this incredible opportunity to enter into the life of God. To enter into the life of God. Advent is the time to prepare, to accept that invitation. Advent 
is a time to hear what that life looks like. And it looks very upside down. It looks like walking down Clifton Hill to look at the beauty of the lights, but being confronted by the young homeless person sitting on the sidewalk and knowing that before you can truly, before you can truly enjoy what you're about to experience, you need to respond to that reality before you. Because you're going to experience beauty. You are going to experience majesty. You are going to experience something of, of an expression of the glory of God. Like that. But here, in that person sitting on that sidewalk, you were experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ before you in the vulnerability of a child lying in a manger. Needing your care. And before you can encounter God in all of God's majesty, you need to encounter Jesus in all of his vulnerability. And that is Advent in its simplest form. And that is what Mary tried to tell us in those first words as she declared the magnificence of her pregnancy and the magnificat of his birth. So during this Advent season, let's not rush to the glory and the singing of the hymns and, the, and bypass where we really need to be. And let's not get lost in the complexities. Let's really break it down into the bare bone simplicity because it's in the bare bone simplicity that we will bring out the true, the true meaning of Christmas and this year, stealing a phrase from, from the Advent conspiracy, this year, maybe Christmas can really change the world. Thanks be to God.